Welcome everyone. Um, this is session 10 of the Thompson Rogers webinar series. My name is Ava Williams and I will be your host today. Today's much anticipated topic is navigating ethical issues facing healthcare providers. Before we start today, we would like to announce that in the spirit of the holidays, we will be giving away a $100 everything gift card to one lucky attendee. We will pick a random number and correspond it to the number order in which you registered. Be sure to stay until the very end to find out if you win. Um, if you have questions, feel free to uh, write them in the chat function or the question and answers function, and I will try and field them as we go through the presentation. Presenting today, we have Darcy Merker, Stephen Berman, and myself. Now let's begin. Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna start first. Uh, we have a great turnout today. I don't know if it's because we have such a great panel or if we have such a great topic, hopefully both. Um, we're gonna talk about ethical issues facing healthcare providers. And the two primary topics we're gonna discuss are client dissatisfaction issues and the ethics of how to help resolve them and provider account issues and ethics. We're also open to talking about other topics time permitting and we have a couple ready to go in case we have extra time. We are intending to finish within a half an hour. I couldn't, can add that to make these presentations good, and we've all been to a lot of them these days, it's best if they're interactive. That's all the feedback we keep getting. So we're gonna try our best to make it interactive. I'm gonna monitor the chat as will Ava and Steven. So please use the chat as a forum to communicate. I know you can't speak with us verbally. Turning to client dissatisfaction issues and ethics. There are two categories of issues that we're gonna talk about. Number one, and this is from a provider's perspective. So when you're the occupational therapist and your client says to you, I'm unhappy with my lawyer, what do you do? What are the issues that arise and what are the ethics? And the second one is when you're another provider, say a physiotherapist, and your client says to you, I'm just not happy with my occupational therapist or my massage therapist or my chiropractor or whomever. And how do you handle that? What are the best practices? And I should add from the outset that nothing we say today, anyone is, should interfere or overwrite anything that's mandated by your colleges. Each discipline involved in this discussion today is from a different discipline, different rules, and those govern. Our advice today is more of a best practice, things to consider. So let's talk about issues between clients and lawyers and what you get told by clients. So I asked the question, and I asked the people in the, who are participating today, what is the number one client complaint about lawyers? And please throw out answers in the chat for what you believe to be the number one complaint. And as a corollary or a follow-up, what are the other common complaints? One word answers, short answers, and we'll see if it jives with what we're gonna about, about to talk about some of the key issues that we see from our perspective. So as they come in, I'm gonna invite Ava to just give us a quick synopsis of the responses. Communication is huge. They don't respond to me. They don't call me back. Um, they're not doing enough. Yeah, communication is huge. It seems like it's a huge issue that um, clients have with their lawyers. Okay, so yeah, I'm looking at the chat as well. Everyone's talking about communication. I never hear from my lawyers. I never know what's going on. So. Guess what? The number one complaint about lawyers from clients is responsiveness. I can't get in touch with them, which is precisely consistent with what all of the feedback, there are dozens of comments saying the exact same thing. It's To me, it's unacceptable. I, I uh, pride myself and Stephen, who I work with, and Ava, who's training under Stephen. We are responsive. My practice is to respond within minutes or hours to client inquiries by text, phone, or otherwise, where I can't respond. And that happens quite a bit. You get an email at five o'clock on a Friday, you don't want to respond, but I don't like the client to think I didn't get it. I never want a client to say, did you get my email? Did you get my text? So I will respond saying, I'm going to respond on Monday morning. And of course you have to follow through. So responsiveness is the number one complaint. And you guys, as the healthcare providers, do a great job helping us navigate that complicated problem, especially with lawyers who are not responsive. Some other issues that we commonly see are knowledge issues. My lawyer just doesn't know what they're talking about and I'm not sure they're right and everyone's sending me different messages and I've read online and I find things different. 
um, delay issues. The process is taking too long. That's what people on the chat are saying as well, that um, everything's taking forever. There's too much paperwork. There's processes too long. Fee issues sometimes creep up. And we see that a lot when um, persons hire paralegals occasionally, and they're getting charged off of income replacement benefits, which we find improper most of the time, subject to a formal retainer agreement specifying so. And then there's some other issues. Ava, are there other issues that you want to throw out there that I may have missed in the chat? You're um, the lawyers don't listen to the client concerns. Um, there's some miss, again, it kind of goes back to miscommunication about transportation fees, uh, fees coming out of settlement. Um, yeah, I think. Okay. So, so let's just talk about how to manage them. The number one answer to how to manage these concerns that are told to you as a healthcare provider by a, a client about the concerns about their lawyer is to facilitate the communication between the client and the lawyer. Now, if responsiveness is a problem, that's going to be a very delicate thing to solve. But you may be able to get the lawyer's attention quicker than the client and rope everyone in to a call, to a discussion, to clarify what the issues are. Is it a knowledge issue and the lawyer doesn't get it? Is it one of the other issues that surface, um, fees being charged, et cetera, and sort it out. Facilitate communication. And I rely on my healthcare providers, the teams that I assemble, to be that first contact point for the client so that any concerns with me can get relayed back to me with client consent. So if the client says, I'm upset with my lawyer, he's not responding, say, do you mind if I reach out to your lawyer and see if we can get a call together? Now, my practice is I send every time I do an update memo on a file, I copy the client. And I think that's great practice because they know there's progress and they know what's going on and they know why there's delay where there's delay. And uh, that usually happens every couple of weeks on every file. And that avoids a lot of these complaints. But you do see it, especially during B's busy season or if the lawyer's at a trial for a while and doesn't have enough attention. So encourage, facilitate communication, help solve the problem, be the peacekeeper, be the middle person who can help the parties dialogue, especially if responsiveness is the area. And then when appropriate, where the facilitation has just proved unsuccessful, discuss second opinion options. That means telling the person, look, if you still have concerns and I've tried to help you facilitate speaking with a lawyer addressing those concerns, if they still persist, then you're always free to speak to a different lawyer about uh, your case. And we field those calls all the time. Now, let's just review a little bit from a second opinion protocol from the lawyer's perspective. When I get a call from somebody who says, I have a lawyer, but I'm not happy with them. I say, I'm sorry to hear that. I strongly encourage you to speak to your lawyer. Have you tried to do that? Because your concerns should be addressed by them. They know your case, I don't. Speak to them, sort it out if you can. Speak to your team, try to work it out. I, I genuinely encourage people to work it out. It usually is the best solution. Now, often they've already done that because people have heard this seminar and heard that the team should help facilitate those communications. So the, the client will often say, I've done that. It didn't work. I'm, I'm past that point. And if they're past that point, or if they call back saying, I, you told me the first time you called to speak to my lawyer, I met with my lawyer, I couldn't get in touch with my lawyer, I now want to chat. Then we think, talk to them about how we can help. And then I talk to them about their case and where I can, I can help if, if, if at all. And I haven't read all their documents. So my advice is very generic and cursory and talks about things like the timeline for a cat designation, the timeline for litigation, why things may be taking slower. But if I do see genuine problems or confirmation the lawyer really isn't responding to the client inquiries, then I'm prepared to take the case on and prepared to speak to the person. How it works from a paper and logistical perspective is the client should not spend any more in total from their recovery by hiring a second lawyer to take over. What happens is the new lawyer, after being retained, alerts the first lawyer that they're taking over the case. And from that point forward, the client should not have to have any further communications with the original lawyer. The original lawyer may call, may be upset. The client does not have to respond. The second lawyer will handle all those communications. And we will settle up with the previous solicitor on their disbursements, the amount they've spent out of pocket, and we'll also receive their fee account on how much they're owed for the time spent and have that addressed in due course. Meaning when the case is resolved, 
whether we agree with their account or have it assessed, meaning decide by a decision maker who evaluates the magnitude of their account when the case is typically when the case is resolved if sometimes prior. So it's with a new lawyer to sort all the paperwork out. It should not result in any additional cost to the client, generally speaking. So that same 30% type contingency fee should apply and the previous listener's account will often be absorbed within that 30%. There are occasions where I'll only take on a case it, where the previous solicitor's invoice is a problem at a little bit higher rates, but generally speaking, it should not result in additional costs to the client. Right, so we Go have ahead. a question from Sophie Gravel, and I think you answered it, but she asks, when the case is resolved, the client will get less due to the payment to the first lawyer, which- Right, yeah, so that, it, that there's some circumstances where that is how it is properly done, but generally speaking, the rule of thumb is that the lawyer's contingency fee will absorb the previous solicitor's account. And it'll a, be up. Sorry? Sorry, we have another question as well from Barbara Baptiste. What happens to the health provider team on the record in the fees that may be outstanding when a client switches over lawyers? Okay, so we're going to be talking about protected accounts, and Stephen's going to be weighing in a lot on that. But the answer is that those will get settled up. And the protected accounts, as Stephen's going to tell you, should be documented in a way that it's binding on a new lawyer as well. So when the case is resolved, it's for the new lawyer, the final lawyer who helps resolve the case to settle up with the previous solicitor. Sometimes we pay them in full. Sometimes we call them and say, we didn't, the client didn't do great on this. You have to reduce your account for these reasons. And besides, you should have done A, B, C, and D. And we make deals. We're generally friendly and we generally want to be paid fairly. And sometimes, you know, we did a great job and deserve to be paid in full. And sometimes you accept that some of the things you did didn't prove to be productive and are fine taking a haircut on your fee account by being paid a third or a half or whatever. So it's the, the settling lawyer to resolve the previous solicitor should not result in additional cost to clients and protected accounts and debts to providers should all be addressed by the new lawyer and the paperwork should reflect all that. The one thing I want to stress on, um, just following up on that is that we do always, always encourage people to try and work things out with their lawyers if they can. Um, it's, it's really important. Um, you know, changing lawyers does add, can result in, in some delay. Like there's, there's no question about that. Um, one, uh, communication I think is the number one uh, issue that leads to people seeking these second opinions or having concerns about their lawyers. But the second issue is concerns about delay. And a lot of times concerns about delay are uh, not properly founded because there's a lot of reasons in these cases why there's, there's delay. Um, so that's one of the things we always look at uh, when we're giving second opinions. And um, if it is an issue of delay and if it's a, a matter that would have been the same, whether we were the lawyers or somebody else, we're going to tell clients that because um, it's, it's, it's important that they, uh, that they understand that. And if their lawyers are doing a good job, it's important that they know that as well. And we would expect other lawyers to do the same thing uh, right. if, uh, if the second opinion were on one of our files. Yeah, no, that's a good point. The second opinion, the client seeking a second opinion does not automatically result in a switching of lawyers. If the second opinion, uh, I often say that your lawyer seems to be doing a good job. I couldn't be doing anything better and I couldn't get it any quicker. So the second sub issue from the dissatisfaction perspective is between a client and a different provider. So that's when the client says to the physiotherapist, I'm not happy with the OT. So the first thing we'd recommend is try to understand the problem. What's the issue? Is it that they show up late? Is that they cancel on short notice? Or is it that they don't know how to treat your injuries from your perspective? And then to encourage, facilitate communication. Again, try to help navigate the problem. We do not like replacing team members. It's expensive and causes delay and can cause problems with the insurance company and raise red flags unnecessarily. So encourage, facilitate communication. Maybe it's the client's fault that the cancellations or the punctuality aspect, it's not legitimate at all. And then involve the lawyer with the client's permission. Say, is it okay if I loop in the lawyer to this? Because I'd like to help resolve those issues and figure out the problems and keep the team intact wherever possible. And remember, it's the client's interests that are always paramount. So if there's a personality clash between providers and it's causing distress rather than helping the client, then let's put the client's interest first and figure out a amicable way to part ways with the provider that's just not being well received and switch it to somebody who is well received because the clients, it's really the client's choice. I sort of handpicked my, my team, but I have regard for my client's preferences and who I think would jive well with them. And I'm not always right. And there sometimes are personality conflicts and we need to switch it up where appropriate at the right time. 
I'm going to turn it over to Stephen to deal with the next issues, and I'm going to toggle through the slides. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, protected accounts, an issue that I know most of you are, are, are often dealing with. And uh, protected accounts make sense in a lot of circumstances, not all, but a lot. And, you know, they often make sense in circumstances where you have a, uh, a client whose claim is not catastrophic, but is likely to have a catastrophic designation where there'll be further funding coming. They may make sense in cases where there's uh, a very good tort case that's going to result in some compensation, but perhaps months or years uh, down the road. So I just have a couple of practice pointers when it comes to dealing with protected account related issues. And feel free to ask any questions on the chat or, or, uh, or interject as well. But the number one question I get about protected accounts is a call from someone asking me, will you protect the account? And I always say, lawyers don't protect accounts. Um, and I say it in a nice way. And I try and explain uh, what I mean by that. And what I basically mean by that is it's, it's the clients who give us instructions to protect accounts out of settlement. And what that means is that the protected account discussion should really from the outset be a three-way discussion between the client, the rehab provider, and the lawyer. So that we're all on the same page. We all understand what exactly the account that's potentially being protected is. And so that we as lawyers have the, uh, the proper paperwork to make sure that this is um, documented and dealt with at the time of, of settlement. And uh, we know a lot of you have your own paperwork. We like to review that paperwork or our clients sign it. We like to see it. We wanna see what it says and we wanna make sure that, uh, that they understand it. Um, that paperwork should be something in the form of what we call an irrevocable direction. So it should be a direction from the client to us, authorizing us to pay the account at the time of a settlement. And it should be irrevocable so that a client can't at some point along the way say, oh, I don't wanna pay for some service that's already being, uh, being provided. Next slide, please, Darcy. Next slide, yeah. So that's the initial upfront paperwork. And then along the way, it's really important. There was a question earlier that was asked about, or I think that was raised about one of the concerns being um, uh, payments coming out of settlement that perhaps clients weren't expecting. It's really important to, to address that issue that these accounts be regularly updated, disclose to clients, that clients know how much they're spending um, so that they have a sense as to what those payments may look like at the time of settlement. And it's really two good ways to do that. One is by uh, regularly updating these accounts and sending out periodic accounts and statements. I know some rehab providers are doing it monthly or every two or three months, whatever it is. Uh, as long as it's regular. And the second good way to address this from my perspective is to, uh, is to put limits on the accounts and usually dollar figure limits. I can tell you about one file I had years ago, which was a, uh, a takeover file where uh, the previous lawyers hadn't put limits on this type of account. And we got to the point of settlement and it was a physiotherapy account and the client thought it would be a three to $5,000 account. And we wrote to the clinic and it was a $25,000 account. And my client was shocked as to you know, how the dollars got to, to that number. And it created a lot of friction between, uh, between him and the clinic, which was unnecessary. And it wouldn't have gotten there had there been regularly a regular updating and had there been a limit on the account. And the great thing about putting a limit on the account is once you hit that ceiling, uh, you can have that three-way discussion with the lawyer again. You can revisit it. You can have another discussion about where the file's at and what's an appropriate uh, you know, uh, protected account amount to, to move the file forward. And the last practice point I put on, uh, on this particular uh, uh, topic is have the lawyer acknowledge the account. And that will happen, of course, if you have this three-way discussion at the beginning. And have the lawyer confirm that if there is a change in counsel, which we've talked a little bit about already, that this irrevocable direction is going to be in the new counsel's file. And have the lawyer connect you with the new counsel. Because um, the last thing you want you want is for the file to end up in, in someone else's hands and then not know about your uh, your account. And of course, that creates chaos and frustration for everyone. Even the one thing I wanted to add to this discussion is, is to explain why it's the client protecting the account as opposed to a lawyer. And, and the answer is, if you go to trial and the cross-examining lawyer asks your client, I hear you got a new house with an elevator. Who paid for it? Oh, my lawyer paid for that. We all have that bad taste in our mouth. It doesn't make sense. It's not legitimate. It sounds scheming. It's for the client to fund it. Now, the client may have to go into debt and might have to provide these protected instructions to get services. And the house is a silly example, but it's for the client to decide, yes, I want massage therapy and I will pay for it 
when I get my settlement, not for the lawyer to say, get massage therapy because it's going to look great at trial. So it's a very subtle but important distinction that the instructions come entirely from the client and is the lawyer is the one who facilitates the paperwork associated. I just saw a question uh, that flashed by. If it's up to the client to protect the, protect the account, why do lawyers uh, reject protection? Um, frankly, I don't know that we have the ability to necessarily reject protection. Um, if a client instructs us to protect some account out of their settlement uh, after our legal fees are paid, then we're going to do that. Uh, our concern, again, is going to be um, uh, that this question as to, you know, is there going to be any money left at the end of the day? Are, is the account going to be paid or not? And we often get questions like that from rehab providers as well. And you want to assure yourself that the, that the account is going to be paid. So uh, I don't know who's necessarily rejecting the protection in those cases. It may sometimes be the, 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 the lawyer suggesting it's not a good idea. It may sometimes be the rehab provider just not willing to take on a protected account. Well, and it, it often is the lawyer because what the team doesn't appreciate is that the viability of these lawsuits rest on somebody else being legally responsible. And we have a lot of cases where the our clients are responsible to a great extent. And if our client's 80% responsible in a slip and fall, they're not gonna get the million dollars they you might think they deserve. And if you have a huge protected account, it wipes out the amount they end up in their pocket. And we don't like how that sits. So we gauge when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate, having regard to the dynamics of each case. So there are circumstances where I say it's probably not a good idea to take a, a protected account or go up to, to a too high of a level. Yeah, good point, Darcy. Um, the next slide deals with another issue that frequently comes up. I'm sure you all see it. Uh, and that's how, how to deal with managing resource limits. We all know that in a non-CAT file, uh, the $65,000 can be exhausted very, very, um, very, very quickly. So how do we all work together to manage these, uh, these resource limits, uh, make sure the client's getting uh, the best level of service, um, um, and I think the, the, the one item we've, we've highlighted here is trying to earlier on submit plans in, in smaller increments uh, is a helpful practice point. Uh, it also helps to potentially avoid uh, IE assessments early on, as we know that the, uh, the insurers put more scrutiny on the, you know, those, those plans that are in larger amounts. So trying to break down your plans can help. It also allows uh, us to ensure that uh, you know, other disciplines are, are placed on the file. Um, creating budgets early on is a great idea if it can be done. Of course, in a non-CAD case, you don't have access to the team meetings, but I like to try and convene a phone call early on among the team members, even if, even if it's not a formal team meeting. We all know how easy it is to convene these calls on Zoom these days. Just have a conversation about, you know, what the funding situation is going to look like. Is there going to be a CAD application? When is the application going to go in? The last thing we all know that you want to see is, is someone have this great team and great level of service that works well for four months and then is, is just gone, simply vanishes. So the, the more we can coordinate uh, in, on this, the better. And one other item, and I think this is where the ethical issue could potentially come up, is if, if you see you know, one of the providers looks like their, their, their bills are too high or you see that there's sort of three disciplines doing the same type of service for whatever reason, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's some clinics out there that offer all sorts of different services and there can sometimes be overlap. Just raise it with us and uh, we can you know, have that conversation with the client, with the clinic, and we can frame it in a way that this is really about managing and preserving funds uh, in the client's interest, as opposed to making any provider feel like um, they're being targeted or picked on or anything like that. There's a couple questions about um, providers taking haircuts on protected accounts. So so the short answer is a provider should never have to take a reduction in their protected account. But usually the protected accounts are conditional on a successful outcome. And successful outcomes are debatable because um, clients never seem to get 100% of what they deserve for a number of legitimate reasons, including the discount associated with an early resolution because it takes us three years to get to trial. So often uh, providers are asked whether they're open to taking a little bit less to make it all work, but they shouldn't have to, generally speaking, and I try to avoid it at all costs. There are cases where we're going to lose altogether and they'll never be paid, so they may be better off taking some amount than none. I'm the same. I, I don't like that. I don't think that should ever happen. Uh, if there's some risk of that, then the provider should really understand that right from the beginning. Uh, we should have a real sense of that right at the beginning of the file. If, there's, if we're placing limits along the way, then that's less likely to happen. So. 
Um, I don't think you should get into negotiating your accounts, taking haircuts. I wouldn't make a practice of it. Next slide, please. Okay, so I've got two final slides. I see we've got a couple minutes left. I'm just gonna go over them both very briefly. They could probably both be presentations on their own, right? Um, one deals with this issue of uh, referral fees and whether lawy lawyers can pay fees to uh, other lawyers or paralegals or uh, third parties in exchange for the referral of clients. This is strictly regulated by the Law Society. Um, since 2017, what the Law Society has, has uh, instructed us is that uh, these types of referral fees can only pay, be paid to other uh, licensed regulated lawyers or paralegals, and there's very strict caps in terms of the amounts that can be paid. Most importantly, uh, referral fees or clients money cannot be paid to, um, to uh, any rehab providers or third parties or non-licensed uh, lawyers or paralegals. So be, be wary of that, be careful of that. And when they talk about referral fees, the rule talks about financial or other reward to any person. So it's, it's broad. And if there are lawyers who are doing these types of things, we've heard of them in the past, and that's just something you wanna stay away from uh, completely. Um, and the last slide, Darcy. The last slide, again, could be a presentation on its own. Know this comes up a lot. Uh, draft reports and communication with the lawyer over draft reports and communication with lawyers who are sometimes subtly encouraging rehab providers to change draft reports uh, or amend them. What the courts have said is that you should, uh, and it's good practice to be sharing draft reports with us, discussing draft reports with you. We do it. Uh, not to uh, influence your opinion, but to make sure your reports are compliant with the strict rules of the License Appeal Tribunal uh, or the court. Uh, your draft reports are not generally reports that would be shared with the other side unless there's reason to suspect that your opinion was improperly influenced by the lawyer, uh, and that should, should never happen. Um, the other reason that uh, draft reports or, dra or communication with us before you finalize reports is a good positive thing from our perspective is there is something that you have to share because um, uh, you have to sh share your honest, your honest and accurate opinion, but that we think may not be helpful to the case. Uh, uh, you know, we may be able to, to uh, engage in settlement discussions or try and resolve the case uh, prior to having to disclose the report. So um, draft reports present some ethical issues on their own, uh, but the, the big takeaway is yes, you can prepare them. Yes, you can share them with us. Um, um, and, um, and you should, and they should be a, a, a point of discussion uh, for, uh, for your interactions uh, with us. But don't, don't change your opinions uh, on lawyer uh, persuasion or anything like that, and that should never happen. So I think, uh, Ava, uh, yeah, I think, uh, are there any questions? I know we're getting close to the to 1030. I, I think there's been a lot of really great questions that perhaps we can answer in an email blast or at a later date. Um, I think we're really cutting it close with the time. Um, yeah, so we'll wrap it up right now. And Ava, you can do the, the wrap up raffle. Um, yeah. This presentation is gonna be available on social media. So if somebody were ask, was asking if it would be recorded, it could be shared. We will be blasting out the link and absolutely share it. Uh, let us know by email or otherwise, if you have feedback or other topics, we're always interested. So Ava? Okay, so I'm going to draw a number. And Stephen will read the name of the lucky recipient. Number 72. Okay, drum, drum roll, please. <laughs> Number 72. I hope not to butcher the last name. Uh, Mara Malozuski. You're the lucky winner of the raffle. Hey. Hopefully you're here. Yeah. Future raffles, we're going to make sure that the winner is actually here. Today, you're the winner, whether you're here or not. If you are here, by the way, uh, put a message in the chat so we all can say hi. Okay. Um, and oh, with that, good. oh, here, oh, yay. Great, congrats. Um, and with that, we're out of time, unfortunately. So thank you for joining us today. And be sure to look out for the next Thompson Rogers webinar session in January, 2021. Uh, more information about that will be posted on our website. And this holiday season, more now more than ever, uh, we hope that you and your loved ones stay safe and um, healthy, and we will see you in the new year. 
Thanks, everyone. Thanks.